So this, ladies and gentlemen, is how I ended up carrying a taser around with me in my purse. We're going back like 10 years here, but my first real job outside of helping with my mom and dad's home business was in the local Walmart. I was 18, super young and naive, but I was very, very proud of the financial independence that job bought me. At least, I was for the first few months or so until it turned into something of a nightmare for me. So as you can imagine, the Walmart team was pretty large, so you could be like weeks into working there and still not know everyone's name. That, and you're almost constantly meeting new people or completely new hires since the shift system gets moved around quite a lot. So I didn't meet this guy Craig until I was maybe six weeks into working there. He was about the same age as me, was a pretty nice guy, but... Most importantly, Craig had his own car which he drove to and from work almost every day. Then once in the break room, we're talking about this and that's when I find out he just so happened to live in the same rough area as me. We happened to be on the same shift pattern at that time so he asked if I wanted to get a ride home with him that evening after work. Of course, I agreed as it'd be cheaper and easier and faster than having to ride the bus home. So for the next few weeks, Craig used to pick me up before work and drive me home after. And for the whole time, he was perfectly nice about the whole thing, and never once did he do anything remotely creepy, either on the drives or at work. He was pretty much the model employee too from the looks of things. All the other associates liked him, and the whole time I worked there, no one ever had a bad word to say about him. Only one night, after he drives me home and pulls up outside of my house, he asked me if we can talk about something. So I say sure and ask him what's on his mind. Craig then asks if I had a boyfriend and I immediately become uncomfortable. I've always been kind of shy about that sort of thing and talking about romantic stuff directly just causes me to lock up and get really anxious. But I told him the truth that no, I wasn't seeing anyone. But I'm dreading where the conversation is headed because as much as I enjoyed his company and thought he was very generous for driving me around so much, I just didn't like him like that. So then he asked me if I wanted to get coffee with him when we both had some time off. Again, I said sure, but stumbled around the words as I tried to make it as clear as possible that it would only be his friends, that it wouldn't be a date or anything like that. I honestly thought he would take it on the chin, like it was an awkward moment for us, but I never expected him to react the way he did. He starts telling me how much he liked me, and how he knew I liked him too, otherwise I wouldn't be spending so much time with him. I just sat there listening to him ramble on. He was delusional, and that's putting it nicely. He obviously saw something between us that just didn't exist. I apologized, like genuinely apology and told him I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but that I just didn't see him as a romantic option for me. I told him I really appreciated the offer, that I was flattered, but that he really was just barking up the wrong tree. Then he locked the car doors. I can't even really describe how horrible I felt in that moment, how I had totally misjudged what kind of guy he was. I tried to open up the passenger door, but obviously it wouldn't open, and in a voice that I know was just racked with fear, I asked him to unlock the doors. He didn't say a word in response. He just gripped the steering wheel in anger for a minute or two as I kept asking him to unlock the door so I could get inside my house. I said I was sorry, over and over again, and begged him to just calm down and let me out. But he burst into some tirade about me wasting his time and taking advantage of him, that I had led him on and how wrong that was for me to do. He said that I owed him, and that's when he put his hand on my knee. I just froze. I didn't know what to do. I grew up something of an ugly duckling, and I honestly just didn't know how to deal with that kind of attention anyway, let alone when it was mixed with just complete and utter terror. But as his hand worked its way up my leg, I just kind of sprang into action, maybe from the adrenaline maybe because I couldn't bear to go through what was about to happen next. I threw his hand off of me, got my phone out, and told him if he didn't let me go that I was going to call the cops. Then Craig actually tried to grab my phone out of my hand before I slapped him so hard that his teeth must have rattled in his head. But he wasn't quite ready to let me go just yet, not until he made it clear that no matter who I told about what happened that night, no one would believe me 
that he would just deny and reflect everything until people thought that I was lying and manipulative. He told me I'd already tricked him into giving me a ride home like every night, and it wasn't a stretch for people to believe I was some crazy attention seeker either. And only then did he actually unlock the doors to his car to let me out. If that sort of thing happened to me today, I'd have put that idiot on blast. But back then, like I said before, I was super young and super naive, and I actually believed him when he said that no one would take my word for what had happened. I lasted like two more shifts at Walmart before I quit. That place was just poison to me after that. I got it into my head that Craig had told everyone what a terrible person I was. I know that sounds crazy, but that's honestly what I believed. I ended up working somewhere else part-time while I attended community college, then moved away from my hometown to pursue my degree. But before I did, I bought a taser, which I still keep in my purse at all times. Because the next time I encounter a Craig who thinks they can treat women that way and get away with it, I promise you, they're going to get the literal shock of their life. I live with my family here in Spokane, Washington. One Friday after school, my dad picks me and my little brother up and tells me we have to head over to the Sprague Walmart to pick up a few odds and ends for the following week. I was excited to just get home so I could start my weekend already, but I didn't mind going over to Walmart with him since I figured I could puppy dog eyes him into buying a few extra sweet treats for me to enjoy. That and the alternative was to walk home and since it looked like it was going to rain, I know I'd chosen the better option. So we wander around Walmart for a little while, talking about how school is going and what our family plans were for the weekend. I get Dad to agree to drive me over to a friend's house the next morning in exchange for a promise that I'll get all my homework done that evening. A small price to pay since there's no way I'd be able to get over there on my own since she lives on the other side of town. So we get checked out, wheel the stuff out to the car, load up into the trunk, and then get ready to leave. But while we're driving out of the parking lot, a woman just sort of appears from nowhere and stands in front of my dad's car. She's wearing a red and black snapback with red hair falling out from under it and a t-shirt that says love on it with the O stylized as a heart. Her clothes aren't dirty or anything, but she looks seriously methed out. What few teeth were still in her mouth were all yellow and rotten and her eyes were just like faded, like there was just nothing behind them. No thought or reason whatsoever. Then she just starts saying, This is my car. Pointing down at the hood like, How did you get in my car? At first my dad is fairly polite with her, but I can tell he's in no mood for messing around. He's all like, uh, Nah lady, this ain't your car. And, Sorry, this must be a mistake. Can you please move out of the street? Thank you and I can tell from the tone of his voice that he's about to get real mad with this lady real fast. But she won't move. She just stands there blocking our car and says, This is my car! Over and over again. That's when my dad turns to me in the back seat and asks if my phone has battery. I tell him yeah, and he tells me to start recording what's happening in case we need evidence to show the cops. My dad seems to give the lady one last chance to get out of the way, and just loses his temper completely and starts barking at her like, Get out of the way! The meth head in front of our car then starts acting like she's the victim in this situation, saying stuff like, I just want to talk. I don't want violence. But I need to know how you got my car. Dad starts screaming at her again to get out of the way, and eventually she does. And we drive along thinking the whole thing is over, and she was just some crazy drugged out meth head with delusions. But the situation doesn't end there. We get to a set of traffic lights further on down the road and someone else then steps in front of the car. This time it's a guy wearing a dark jacket with short hair and a mustache like each of those scumbags look like they could have been paid extras on Breaking Bad and he's putting on a similar act to the methed up lady who managed to catch up by this point. He's all like, Can you get out? This is my car. And it's about that time I realized this was just a straight up attempt to carjack us. He wasn't like, hey this is my friend's car and nothing like that. This was 
obviously some messed up plan that they put together to coerce some naive stranger out of their car so they could just steal it. The guy in front then puts his hand in the inside of his jacket, like he's about to get a gun out or something, but still remains all calm, like, Just talk to me, dude. This is my car. How did you get my car? Dad turns to my brother Max and tells him to call 911. Max is shaking like a leaf, and he does as he's told, getting his phone out and dialing 911 while my dad is still telling this guy in front of us to get out of the way. But it's not just me and Max that are scared at this point. I can hear it in my dad's voice too. And that really, really got to me. My dad is tough. Like, to me, he's the strongest man in the world, and up until that point, I'd never heard his voice go like that. It's something I don't think I'll ever forget. So as soon as Max has the 911 dispatcher on the line, Dad takes the phone off of him and starts explaining the situation to the person on the other end. As he's doing this, some guy with a beard, sunglasses, and a blue hoodie then starts walking over to the driver's side. Dad tells Max to lock his door, but because he's on the phone and slightly panicking by this point, he forgets to lock his own side. So this blue hoodie guy actually managed to open Dad's door all calm and ask, What are you doing? This is her car. While he points over at the meth head lady, Dad then replies all polite, This is not her car. Then tries to shut the door again. The guy flips, trying and flailing to pry open the door again before Dad shuts it, screaming to get out of the car, get out of the car, while kicking the driver's side door. If they had just came up to try to carjack us, that would have been bad enough. But the mind games they were trying to play with us, that was what was really scary. Like they expect us to just be like, oh I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was a car that some meth head could afford, we'll just get out and be on our way. God, it makes me so angry thinking about it now, but at the time, all I could do was burst into tears as I filmed the whole thing. Right then, some other meth head appears at the passenger's side where Max was sitting and starts banging on his side of the door too. Dad starts trying to drive around the gang that was now surrounding us and the dark jacket guy then jumps on the hood of the car while another starts smashing a bicycle into the passenger door. Dad then seizes the opportunity and drives off down the avenue with one of the meth heads still lying on the hood. He's driving fairly slowly, talking to the 911 dispatcher the whole time careful not to drive too fast in case the guy on the hood falls off and we accidentally run him over. But the next thing I know is there's this big roar of an engine to our right hand side and the guy in the blue hoodie is on a motorcycle revving the engine and preparing to give chase. He's pulling up alongside us every so often to shout slow down, slow down, let the guy off and dad realizes he's talking about the guy lying on the hood. Dad slows down for like two seconds and the guy on the hood, who is obviously realizing what a stupid situation he's got himself into, rolls off the hood and runs over to the sidewalk to escape what could have amounted to a serious, life-changing injury. Not that he didn't deserve it, I just really didn't want to see my dad go to jail over something like that, when it most definitely was not his fault that this psycho was crazy or desperate enough to try to carjack us in such a terrifying way. After that, the biker guy stopped following us, and we got home safe without anyone actually getting hurt. I was still crying as we pulled up outside our house, and even Max was really shaken up when he's normally so cool and nonchalant about everything. But I wasn't crying out of fear anymore. It was just pure relief and gratitude that Dad had handled the situation so well. We all hugged it out when we got inside, with Mom all panicked and wanting to know why we were all upset. I'll always remember Dad was like, I'm your father and I'll always protect you when I can. I don't think I've ever loved him as much as I did in that moment. I don't really want to go into details about the interactions we had with the cops afterward. They insisted it was all just a misunderstanding, but anyone who was there would know it was so much more sinister than that. Those dirty meth heads were trying anything they could to slow us down and get us out of our car so they could steal it, and the fact that no one was arrested for it is something else that fills me with such rage even today. But there is a kind of uplifting ending. Since Dad posted the video online, a few people have reached out and offered to fix some of the damage inflicted, which is nice, but it just reminds me like, if it really was your car, why would you damage it like that just to get a person out? We know what happened that day, 
It was no misunderstanding. It was just a stupid plan to rob us that only a bunch of methed up crankheads could have even dreamed of. And it failed. Just like they failed in their miserable lives and ended up on the street having to rob people. I have no idea of the things that went wrong for them to end up like that. And maybe I shouldn't be so quick to judge them since I don't know what they've been through. But I do know one thing is for absolute certain. And that's that I have the best dad a girl could possibly wish for. And I love him with all my heart. I work at a Walmart here in Duncan, Oklahoma. Duncan is a small city of about 23,000 people located 80 miles south of Oklahoma City. And other than the farming and oil industries that employed most of the people here, there's not all that much to do in Duncan. It's honestly a pretty basic and boring place to live. Needless to say, I've always wanted to get out of here and last year added an awful, traumatizing memory to the already rock-bottom prospects, which has given me even more motivation to leave this place behind forever. So, as for what happened, it all went down on a Monday morning back in November of 2019, as if Monday mornings weren't bad enough already. My shift was due to start at 9am sharp, and I do that thing where you wake up all like, wow, I feel surprisingly well rested. Roll over and realize you've not set an alarm the previous night and are way, way late for whatever it is you were supposed to get up for. Like I said, I was in due to work at 9 and I didn't wake up until like 9.10am. I immediately fly out of bed, shoot my boss a message saying that I was having a car problem and I'd be there as soon as possible. She was pretty cool about it, telling me not to worry and to let her know if I had any more issues getting to work. I was never, ever late before and I guess that bought me a little goodwill. Anyway, I grab a cold Pop-Tart, run out to my car and set off on the half hour drive over to the Walmart. The day started terrible enough, but... I had absolutely no idea how bad it was about to get. It was like 9.50 by the time I park my car, throw on my associate's vest and begin the walk across the parking lot. I get halfway across the parking lot when I hear something popping to the right of me. Something that at first just sounded like firecrackers to my half-awake brain. But then I hear the screams. These blood-curdling screams as people to the left and right of me start running in the same direction away from the popping sounds. My head spins around, zoning in on where the sounds are coming from, and all I see is this one guy, arm extended with a pistol, firmly in his grip. He was aiming it at the windshield of a parked red car, just unloading bullets into the windshield over and over and over again. Not all that fast, just these slow, methodical pop, pop pops as he takes aim and pulls the trigger. My first thought was that it was some kind of mass shooting, given that it was only three months or so after that psycho racist guy shot up the Walmart down in Texas. So, as soon as I see him firing, I just throw myself behind another one of the parked cars, making myself small so I can kind of fit myself behind one of the tires. I know I should have just kept moving, but I figured the guy was about to head into the Walmart to continue shooting. In fact, now I really cast my mind back. I have no idea what I was thinking. I'd never been that scared in my entire life, like I don't even think I could put that kind of terror into words. My mind is just all over the place. I can hear my heart thumping in my chest. I mean, the adrenaline hit was like nothing I'd ever felt before. Next thing I know, I actually see the guy walk around the back of the red car like he walks into a position where we can both see each other through the gaps in the car. I couldn't move, like I wanted to run, but I just locked up, sat there with my knees in my chest just waiting for him to look up and lock eyes with me. I thought it was a dead man. I thought he was going to look up, see me, and just open up with that pistol. But he doesn't. He doesn't even look at me and I watch as he just sort of stands there for a moment, looking down at the ground and shaking his head like he's thinking, what have I done? I thought the look on his face was just pure anger, but then I realized he was crying, like his features were all screwed up with this ugly, silent crying. Seeing someone in that kind of emotional wreck with a gun in their hand, dude, there's nothing I can imagine that's more terrifying than that. 
but why he had chosen to take it all out on the public in such a violent way I had absolutely no idea, no inkling whatsoever. He didn't shout anything, he was just wearing civilian clothes, and they only fired a few shots before he stopped and just kind of broke down at the rear of the red car. I hope those were the only bullets that he would fire that day, and that he just surrendered to the cops whose sirens I could hear getting louder and louder as they got closer. But he wasn't done shooting at that point. He had just one more bullet to fire, and I watched, frozen in place as he stuck the barrel under his jaw and one fluid motion pulled the trigger. Pink mist sprayed out of the top of his head as his knees buckled out from under him, and he crashed to the tarmac in a crumpled heap. And the blood. Dear God, the amount of blood that just started pumping, and I mean pumping out of his head, in these thick, big spurts. I puked up that cold Pop-Tart between my legs immediately. I just sat there, vomit between my legs until the cops showed up and asked me if I'd been shot. I told them no. Not with words, by the way, just with these pathetic shake of my head as they got me up and walked me over to a cruiser to take a statement. It took me a while to be able to speak, and they just asked me yes, no questions until I could actually get words out to tell them what I'd actually seen in detail. After that, they drove me back home and I took like a week off to recover. I just couldn't face going back there so soon after what I'd seen, and management were okay with that once they were aware of what I'd been witness to. The craziest thing though is that the Walmart didn't even close. I heard there were school shutdowns in the area, as is the usual protocol when there's a shooting like that, but after the shooting had stopped, people just sort of went about their business. Like by the time I was driven home by the cops, other than the police tape and the heavy law enforcement presence, You'd think nothing had happened there at all. It was just surreal to see, especially since, like I said before, it had only been like a few months since the mass shooting down in El Paso. It was all over the news that afternoon, but it was only the following morning that the details surrounding the motive and the people involved came out. The victims' names were Rebecca Varela and her boyfriend Aubrey Perkins. The pair had been apparently dating, with Rebecca being a Duncan native while her boyfriend was from another city not too far away. They'd gone to the Walmart that morning to pick up a few things before spending the day together, and as far as I can tell, they were madly in love. But it was not the wholesome little romance you might expect, because as it turns out, Rebecca was still married to a guy named Wubliadu Varela Jr., and as it seems... Wibliadu didn't share his wife's feelings that their marriage was over and that they could date other people. Because apparently he followed them to the Walmart that morning, waited until they left the store and gotten back into their car, then walked up and executed them both as they sat in the front seat. He was also apparently unwilling to face the consequences of his actions, which is what led himself to end his own life in front of me that morning, in a way that I don't think I'll ever really get out of my head. The one thing that always kind of plays out in my mind, though, is how if I'd actually set that alarm on Sunday evening, I wouldn't be in this situation. Like, yeah, I'd have been in work and heard about the shooting and been all scared thinking he was going to walk inside and start unloading onto the people inside, but I'd never have seen him shoot his wife and her boyfriend, and I'd never have seen him end his own life in such a horrendously violent way. That's the scariest thing to me. Like more messed up than all the blood or the gunshots or the look on the guy's face before he pulled the trigger on himself. How one little mistake can just change a person's life forever. One little screw up, like not setting an alarm, can mean they witness things or have things happen to them that mean they have nightmares for months, therapy for nearly a year after the event, things that reverberate through their lives, maybe even for the rest of their days. Life is weird like that, I suppose. All this stuff that's just around the corner, dependent on the most seemingly insignificant little actions. Take a moment to consider that. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow or even in the next hour. What follows could be the best day ever or just as easily one of the worst days of your entire life.
This is the story of the single most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me in all my 26 years on this earth and how it took place in a Walmart parking lot and how it's pretty much completely my fault it happened in the first place. I'm not going to give you my name or wherever this happened and the reason for that will become pretty obvious as the story progresses. Okay, so this year has been absolutely disastrous in terms of dating for me. I broke up with my girlfriend in February, like right before Valentine's Day. It was mutual and it didn't suck as bad as you might think. Point being, it didn't take me all that long to get over her and within like two months, I was back on dating apps and looking for the next girl. Then in May, I hooked up with this girl who I thought might be like real wife material. She seemed absolutely perfect for me in every way and she absolutely bowled me over with date after date. Like the second time we went out to a local park for a picnic I'd put together for us, she brought me a rose. A single red rose wrapped up in brown paper and rough ropey string from her art supplies. The whole role reversal thing just blew me away and I held that thing like a trophy, not giving a good care what people thought of a guy getting all smitten because a girl had gotten him a rose. But long story short, it didn't work out with her. She was really intense, then uncaring, over the course of like a fortnight and then really messed with my head, but I got over it and moved on. Only almost the exact same thing happened time and time again over the following months, and the more it happened, the harder I took it. I suppose it was just like emotional exhaustion or something, like I'm not one to get all depressed over a girl, especially not one I'm not actually with, but like I said, each time it happened, I got more and more hopeless and eventually just lost my ability to be able to deal with it. This leads me to the end of last month. During a week, I had two dates lined up with two different girls. Let me be clear, I'm obviously not trying to show off here. Pretty much everything I've had with girls this year has face-planted in spectacular failing fashion. But if I say so myself, I'm not terrible looking and I know how to talk to girls. So using the miracle, or the nightmare, whichever you want to look at them as, that is dating apps, I managed to line up dates with the two girls I mentioned, one for a Tuesday and the other for the Saturday of the same week. So I'm at my job at a local convenience store, of which I am usually the only clerk on duty whenever I'm working. I'm kind of bored, so I message each of the girls just confirming that our respective dates are still scheduled. I didn't suspect their disinterest. I'm purely inquiring as I was vibing with each of them and everything seemed all good. Then within like an hour of each other, I got a message off of each of the girls basically saying, nah, I'm just not feeling this. You're a nice guy, but I don't think we're a good fit. Those two messages coming in so fast just sort of broke me. I felt like a straight up ogre. Just a mess of a person who no one would ever want. Like I went on dates with like seven different girls over the course of about three and a half months and not a single one, not a single one was into me. So I just snapped. I'm not in the least bit proud of this and I totally acknowledge that this is no way to deal with rejection, but I can't change the fact that this is what I did. In full view of the CCTV camera the store had, I just walked out from behind the register and over to the wine chiller took out a random bottle, unscrewed the cap, and drank as much as I could before I felt like puking up, which turned out to be a lot. I held it down though. I mean, I had to if I wanted to get out of my head, right? Then, still coughing and spluttering from filling my stomach with cheap, terrible wine, I walk over to the liquor shelf and I'm basically just like, mine, with a bottle of wild turkey. I don't even like wild turkey, but that's just how terrible I felt. Any booze would do the job. Taste wasn't important. After that, while I was basically in some fugue state of almost nervous breakdown, after that, while I was basically in some fugue state of almost nervous breakdown, I left the store at like one in the afternoon, bottle of turkey in hand, walked off into the afternoon sun to drink myself into oblivion. The next thing I remember is opening my eyes to that big old blue Walmart sign with the yellow flower sunbeam thing next to it. It was dark out. I had no idea what time it was, and I had no idea how I'd gotten there. It takes me a minute or two to work out that I'm lying face down in the darkness outside another commercial lot that's all closed up while the Walmart is obviously open 24 hours. My head is spinning, 
There's puke all over the ground in front of me, and I remember feeling hungry. Like really, really hungry. My ears are ringing. I'm pretty sure my nose was blocked with puke or blood or something. And last but not least, I can feel the breeze on my bare butt. For some reason, I'd seen it fit to either pull my pants down or take them off altogether. I couldn't remember which. Or at least, that's how I thought things had gone down. Until I felt this tugging feeling near my knees. I craned my neck to look behind me and... I see that there is an actual drug addict slash alcoholic looking dude back there tugging my pants down while he's kneeling over my legs with his wiener out, getting ready to, well, you can guess what, I don't need to say it. And I'm sorry if there wasn't any kind of trigger warning on this, just writing the R word is just a bridge too far for me right now. So that's how I ended up fighting a homeless guy who was about to essentially have his way with me rolling around the parking lot of a Walmart at like 2 in the morning with my pants down. I don't want to get into too much detail because I don't think I could honestly say what little I remember from the time without this post getting removed or whatever, but it was a horror movie. A pure horror movie. Like I was fighting for my life and I mean that with every fiber of my being. I fought like an animal because I've never known a feat like that could even exist. Like I don't mean to sound melodramatic, but... That would have been a fate worse than death for me. Death is nothingness in my mind, but if what he wanted to do with me had actually gone down, I had to actually have to live with it for the rest of my life, or rather, what little life I could bear to live with after something like that. Anyways, it took me a while of struggling, biting, throwing elbows and knees, but I left that guy on the concrete in a terrible, terrible state. Yet, I'm sure you agree that it's exactly what he deserved. That's what everyone who tries to do something like that deserves, and that's truly what I believe. I don't know if he died from that beating I gave him once I managed to get the upper hand. I certainly didn't see anything about it in the news the next few days, no mention of a body or anything like that. The fact of the matter is, I'll never really know what happened to that homeless guy, only that I managed to escape something well and truly horrific. I should make it clear, too, that this is something I've never told my family or even my closest friends. I've thought about talking about it with them, a lot actually, but I just don't quite know how to start that kind of conversation. Same reason I've never sought actual professional therapy about it, I just can't see myself sitting down with something and actually discussing it. It all just seems so much easier to write this out on the internet, purely anonymous. Just getting it off my chest is giving me some degree of closure. I'm not proud of stealing from my workplace, which I was obviously fired for. I'm not proud of beating that guy half to death, and I don't think it makes me sound like some kind of hardcore cool guy, and I certainly didn't feel like one at the time. I was scared to death. If anything, this should serve as a warning to people to deal with their problems in a way that isn't so destructive, and especially not to use drugs or alcohol as a way of self-medicating, because that stuff only ever has the capacity to make a situation infinitely worse. I've been shopping at Walmart for pretty much my entire life. Like even when I was a kid, I'd go along with my single mom on trips down to the super center like once or twice a week. So as you can imagine, I've seen my fair share of weird and scary stuff go down there, from associates having straight up fist fights in the parking lot to people going to the bathroom in the aisles. But one single incident stands head and shoulders above the rest for me as the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me at a Walmart. Like my mom before me, I too became a mother at quite a young age. It started as a stupid mistake at a college party where a broken condom turned into me having to consider terminating, but I decided to keep the baby and it was the best decision I'd ever made. With my mom's childcare and financial help, I could still continue my studies and now I have a wonderful young son that I consider an absolute blessing. If I could go back and live my whole life again, I wouldn't change a single thing. Then, in 2016, something happened that rocked the small town I live in. A kid went missing from their elementary school. Teachers saw the kid leaving hand in hand with a woman they recognized as not being the child's mother, but didn't report it, assuming the woman was a nanny or something. Missing posters went up all over town. Vigils were held. 
The mom made a tearful appearance on TV begging for anyone with information regarding her kid's whereabouts to please come forward, but no one did. A week later, the kid's body was found buried in a shallow grave over in some woodland just outside of town. The entire population went into mourning. It was absolutely horrendous, and I considered just how easily it could have been my kid that just up and disappeared, only to turn up dead a short time later. No arrests were made either. Local sheriffs urged us to report any suspicious behavior to them immediately. I remember they even listed little things that we should consider as suspicious, such as a guy shaving who normally maintained a beard, people parking their cars in garages who normally parked in the street. For all intents and purposes, the killer was still at large, and the whole town was rife with paranoia. A few weeks later, I took my son down to the local Walmart with me to do some shopping. My mom wasn't always available to babysit, and this was back when I couldn't always afford a sitter to look after him, so I had very little choice other than to take him down there with me. This was at a time when he was way too big for the baby seats they have in the shopping carts, so I had to just keep him by my side as I wheeled the cart around to get the grocery shopping done. Now, if there are any parents reading this, you'll know of the pure nightmare that is passing the toy section in a store when you have a young child with you. It's like herding cats. They just run off all wild, and you pretty much have to just wait until their attention span dwindles before you can get them moving again. So I have to pretty much bargain with my son that if he's extra good and follows me around the store like a good boy, we'll go back to the toy section when we're all done and I'll buy him something. He smiles and agrees, and we're back on our way again. About ten minutes later, after making sure he's been close behind the entire time, I turn around and find that my son is nowhere to be seen. I retrace my steps, calling his name expecting him to just be around the corner in the previous aisle, having gotten distracted by some colorful label or something, but he's nowhere to be found. I then start wheeling down the center aisle, looking left and right in the hopes that I'd spot him somewhere, but again, nothing. This is about the time I go into full-on panic mode. I remember just how easily it had been for the person that abducted the murdered child to just take them by the hand and walk them to their doom. I had images flashing in my mind of someone leading my son out of the store into the parking lot and into a waiting van where he would be driven off and subjected to God knows what before they ended his young life. I abandoned my shopping cart and start basically running around the store asking if everyone had seen a little boy wearing a blue sweater, which is what he was wearing at the time, walking by himself or with another person. Each of them says no, but each also knew why I was asking, and given the recent events that were now haunting the town, the look of panic and fear in their eyes when I asked them if they'd seen my son, well, that was enough to have me almost hysterical with panic. I was in floods of tears by the time I made it over to customer services. I could barely calm myself down to tell them what the situation was, realizing that my inability to properly communicate what the problem was only meant that more valuable time was being wasted when I needed my son found alive and well as quickly as possible. I managed to take a few breaths in the end and get it out that I had lost my son somewhere in the aisles. God bless those folks behind the counter because they knew immediately what to do. Put an announcement over the loudspeakers in the store that if any associate saw a kid in a blue sweater that they were to escort them to customer service as soon as possible. Minutes went by and nothing happened, and I was just convinced my kid was gone for good. I can't even put into words how intense and painful that kind of feeling was, how I felt like a terrible mother and it was just going to be me crying on TV and having journalists banging on my door after countless hours of police interviews, and all that would come with being the parent of a missing child. But then, out of nowhere, I heard a voice cut through the maelstrom of panic in my head, Hey lady, is this your kid? I look up and there's this guy holding my son's hand, who is silently sobbing as he walks towards the customer service counter. I've never been so singularly and absolutely relieved in my entire life, like I felt it wash over me in waves and I rushed over to my son and took him up in my arms. And We cried together for a few minutes and I was too happy to even get mad at him for wandering off, which is apparently what he'd done wandered off to go looking for the toy section since he was bored, which also happened to be the one place I'd failed to look in my abject panic. 
Then he'd panicked when he'd gone to try and find me again and gotten lost near the auto parts since we basically never went near that end of the store. I then wildly and profusely thanked the guy who'd found him for bringing him over to the customer service area, even trying to give him all the cash I had in my purse as a reward. Naturally, he refused to take it, saying it was the least he could do, given the recent incident, tragic events that had touched everyone in the worst way possible. I was just a wreck by that point, apologizing to pretty much everyone for making such a scene and being a bad mom, but the workers there were just amazing even asking if the abandoned cart near the frozen food section was mine, and if I wanted them to bag all the groceries up before helping me take them to my car. I honestly don't know what I would have done without their kindness that day, and I cannot thank them enough for taking care of us. But yeah, that was without a doubt the scariest thing I've ever experienced in a Walmart, and probably in my entire life too. Just typing it all out is giving me the jitters just remembering what an absolutely terrifying experience it was, thinking I'd lost my son like that, especially given that there was an actual child predator on the loose at that time. I'm sorry if this got so long or rambly at points, I'm honestly not much of a writer, I don't think. Just please, if you take away anything at all from this, it's that I'm begging you. Keep an eye on your kids at all times. There are some truly evil people out there in the world. I work at Walmart, and as many of you might know, a lot of our stores have associates managing the front entrance to ensure that all customers that enter the store are wearing masks. The order came into effect on July 20th, and all associates had to attend a mandatory training seminar, not only to educate them on the reasoning behind the decision, but also how to deal with any customers who refuse to comply with the steps put in place to control the spread. Management also understood that since there was a lot of pushback with regards to mask wearing, it would be a high pressure role, so a system was put in place whereby each shift would have a different associate working with the usual greeter whose job was to enforce the new regulation. The way they put it, if someone refused to wear a mask when entering the store, it was the relevant associate's jobs to quote, find a solution to the problem, which from what I understood was just a polite way of saying, Either wear a mask in the store or get lost. We were even authorized to give out free masks to people to basically make it impossible to give us a I can't afford one excuse. So anyway, once the order was put in place, it only took a few days before it was my turn to man the front entrance. And I'll admit, I was kind of nervous about it as I had already heard a few horror stories from other associates who'd gotten into arguments with irate Karens who screamed about infringing their rights and all that other stuff but for the first few hours everything was cool. Not a single person had a problem with putting a mask on and those that had either forgotten to bring one or hadn't gotten word of the enforcement had absolutely no problem taking one of the free ones that we were instructed to give out. Then, just as I thought the whole thing was going to be much easier than first anticipated, I see this woman pushing a cart towards the front entrance who I could just tell was going to be a problem. If there's one thing working with the public had gotten me attuned to, it's that some people just give off a whole bunch of bad energy, and this woman was one of them. So, as you can guess, when I stop her and politely tell her that she needs to wear a mask to shop in our Walmart, she starts pushing back. After a few minutes of back and forth with her getting increasingly confrontational and combative, she tried to straight up barge past me with her shopping cart, so unfortunately I had to call security to get her to leave. But before she does, she looks me dead in the eye and says, You're gonna be sorry for this young man. You just wait and see. I figured she was going to attempt to make a complaint to corporate and totally did not expect what happened next. Because not long after the Karen leaves, this other dude comes marching up to the front entrance, only this guy is actually wearing a face covering. I didn't figure he was going to be a problem until it became obvious that he wasn't wearing a mask to stop the spread. He was wearing a mask because he didn't want to be identified when he pulled a knife out of his back pocket and put it right up to my throat. He starts growling all this stuff, how, you think it's okay to treat women like that, huh? And how, punks like you need to learn respect. Turns out it was Karen's husband who she'd evidently unleashed on me because I'd disrespected her or whatever. Dude, feeling the cold metal of that blade against my throat, 
I can't even tell you how scary that was for me. Everything just kind of slowed down while I waited for him to take it away. I mean, I didn't really think he was going to do anything. There were so many witnesses around and stuff, but Jesus, there is still that chance that he was crazy enough to actually do it, you know? He left long before the cops arrived to take statements, and as far as I know, they never found the guy to arrest him. This whole pandemic thing has been hard on all the associates. I mean, it's been tough on everyone, but I feel like for some people it's driving them to the absolute breaking point. I'm just thankful that guy didn't have it in him to actually do anything, or I might not be around to be writing this right now. Be good to each other, people. Times are hard enough without us all getting all crazy on each other. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, always sop it up with a biscuit.